I'm Lorraine Jordan, and I'm honored and privileged to open this event for you today. I'm going to, um, first of all, wish you a very happy Women's Day. I'm going to sing a song before the amazing panelists come and join me on stage. She stood as tall as tall could be Looked as far as she could see In her heart she held the question How far now can it be? How far now can it be? How far now can it be from me? She's flown above the mountain peaks and swam into the deepest seas Climbed upon the forest trees To find a melody to find a melody, to find the sweetest melody. She's traveled east and traveled west, never stopping for a breath. Then something deep inside her said, Sit down and take your rest. Sit down and take your rest. Sit down and take your rest right now. Da -da 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 To rest her weary legs And in the breathing of each breath She found the answer She found the answer She found the answer to her, her quest She stood as tall as tall could be for she could see and in her heart she held the answer it's always been with me always been with me it's always been right Thank you, and welcome. Do we have a micro? Ah, we do. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Lorraine Jordan. This was Lorraine Jordan. Remember this name. She is an amazing singer and supporter of Rowan War, as you, as you have heard. <laughs> so welcome. I see there are no uh, empty chairs, and we're very, very pleased, because the women that we will be talking to today are really exceptional. Uh, first of all, happy International Women's Day from all of us, again. And just a few words of introduction. I'm Mariana Katsarova. I'm the founder of Raw in War, Ritual Women in War, the organization that is partnering today with the WOW Festival to bring to you the voices of exceptionally brave women 
human rights defenders from war and conflict in the world. What is raw in war? And I just immediately want to encourage you after the event to go to our colleagues who are right there at the stall of raw in war and take our materials and support us. Find us on Facebook, find what we're doing. Raw in war is a small but very loud human rights organization. <laughs> it's a women's rights organization that supports women human rights defenders from war and conflict zones in the world. Why only women? Because usually during war, the men are fighting, they're arrested, they're the soldiers, they're away. And it's the women that keep the society together, the community together. Women are also the majority of the victims and the refugees. As you know, 80% of the refugees during conflict are usually women and children. But women are also the activists, the journalists, the doctors, the ordinary people that turn into keepers of the life, of the flame, of the community, of the voice of the victims, of the survivors of the violence. And I was thinking when preparing for this, for this event today, what kind of questions am I going to ask these women today? Um, and I thought, well, I actually have a question for all of us. What would you do if war comes to your country? What would you do? Would you become a voice? Would you become a healer? Would you become, you may become a ref the refugee, but you will probably, all of us, will have some role to play, especially as women in such times. And this is what happened to the brave women that we're going to talk today with and about. Um, with me are, and I'll just briefly introduce them, and then we'll come back to questions, uh, Elena Kudimova. Elena is a sister of Anna Politkovskaya. Roin War presents already for seven years the Anna Politkovskaya Award. We present it because we want to honor brave women, activists, journalists, any profession really. They could be actresses, they could be singers, they could be doctors, but women that do something to make it easier for the survivors of violence in conflict, to bring the voice of the victims of violence in war and conflict around the world, like Anna did as a journalist. And we'll speak to Elena about Anna. Uh, next to me is Masih Alinejad. And I will go back to speak with Masih and about Masih in five minutes again, when we start the questions. But I just want to say, um, Masih is an exceptional journalist from Iran. She has survived numerous death threats. She still, although living in exile in this country, is subjected to a lot of, what, monthly or weekly? Weekly. Weekly. Death threats by the Iranian authorities because she exposed the corruption of the authorities. She was a parliamentary journalist in Iran. And next to her is Mariam Suleiman from Darfur. Mariam is a doctor, similarly to Halima Bashir, who was the 2010 Anna Politkovska Award winner. Mariam is running her own organization, The Voice of Darfur Women, helping women refugees from Darfur. For her, Halima Bashir was a total inspiration. I forgot to tell you that in 2009, and Masik will speak about this, the Iranian women from the One Million Signatures campaign got our award, Tiana Politkovska Award. We usually give it to one person, but that year was the year when Natalia Stemirova, our first award winner from activist from Chechnya, was abducted and killed. And we thought, we will not be silenced. We are not going to be scared. We're going to give this award to one million 
people, men and women, standing on street corners in Iran and um, collecting signatures under a petition for equality. I would like, before further ado, to actually remember Anna and hear what Anna had to say about taking risks, being brave, and being a journalist. Меня сегодня удручает, что я работаю как похоронная команда. Это самое страшное, что происходит для меня лично. Похоронная команда, которая просто отдает последнюю дань людям, которые непонятно за что погибли. Я думаю об этом следующее, что риск, в принципе, является частью нашей профессии. То есть это не является частью профессии учителя или врача, или еще какого. Но нашей это является. Поэтому... Э, Мы готовы. То есть, то есть мы, вот я считаю, что журналист готов, он должен смотреть на это открытыми глазами и понимать, что это может быть. Не пугаться, там, не плакать от сам. Главный вопрос в другом. Что меняется от того, что мы написали ту или иную статью и даже пострадали за нее? Поменялось ли что-то в нашем обществе в лучшую сторону? Мы живем теперь э, в эпохе смещенных нормальных ценностей. Хорошее названо плохим, плохое хорошим. А я уже не считаю, что у нас э, существует свобода слова в том понимании, в котором она была в Ельцинской период. Э, у нас все равно уже существует дозированное э, право на, на получение и э, распространение информации. Самоцензура действует четко. В большинстве изданий даже не берутся писать об этих чеченских проблемах, да? потому что знают, что после этого последует окрик и масса неприятностей. Если еще в начале войны какие-то газеты как бы трепыхались, то сейчас, извини, этого уже нет. Поэтому назвать это существование свободы слова в соответствии с Конституцией, это у нас же есть все в Конституции, уже нельзя. Я абсолютно в этом уверена. Сейчас какое-то такое, на мой взгляд, неосоветское время. В принципе, советская по идеологии существует уже линия партии, так сказать, а все то же самое, которое надо придерживаться. В ходу враг народа, антисоветчик, вот это уже как-то все это говорится. Но на новом экономическом витке когда есть частная собственность, когда есть богатые люди. Но идеология возвращается к тому времени, при котором я сама работала, это середина 80-х годов. So, we just heard from Anna, and actually this film, I interviewed her in her office probably, I don't know how many years ago, it was... Um, no, 10 years ago. 10 years ago. <laughs> as if she is talking today. I mean, yeah. reading the news actually about Crimea and mm -hmm. what's happening at the moment in <laughs> Russia, as if it, it's really happening today. Um, what motivated Anna? I mean, she, she was a Moscow journalist. She had quite a good life. She had children. She was 
you know, why did she have to go to Chechnya? Why did she have to do what she did? What motivated her? What do you think? Um, she first went uh, to Chechnya uh, while she wasn't working for Novaya Gazeta. It didn't exist at the time. She was uh, brought by her editor-in-chief uh, while she was uh, observer at Obshia Gazeta, which, which uh, doesn't exist anymore. And uh, it was during the first uh, Chechen war. Uh, and uh, she saw so many uh, terrible things which happened to uh, ordinary people that when the Second Chechen War started, you know, she just couldn't uh, stay in Moscow, you know, she had uh, to go and uh, just uh, bring all the news which was uh, there and wasn't uh, generally covered by the uh, state media. Uh, just to bring this information uh, to people, uh, because uh, Chechnya is uh, part of the of Russia. Uh, they are all Russian citizens as well. So uh, it was like um, civil war inside the country, uh, which sounds absolutely terrible, and uh, that's why uh, when uh, the war, second war started, she went there. But Elena, at some point, she, be, she remained the only voice, of, uh, the only independent voice of a journalist going in and out in Chechnya, bringing, really bringing these stories that you could not read anywhere else about torture, about mass murder of civilians. I mean, exactly. how did she keep going? Oh, it was extremely difficult for her. Uh, you know, but she was... Uh, she kept going because at some point when she was ill and uh, couldn't go and uh, her uh, newspaper sent uh, uh, a man correspondent there for 10 days, he came back and told he, he couldn't go there anymore because it was too stressful for him, you know. And uh, so uh, it was the only time when sh she missed actually because she was ill. And uh, otherwise she was going there uh, almost every month, I think. For, for years. I mean, Anna was threatened so many times, and I know because I was working at Amnesty International then, and I would be in touch with Anna, we would work together. But, I mean, she survived death threat, she survived the poisoning um, on an airplane, going down to, um, to, to the hostage taking. Yes. In yes, Beslan, in Beslan yes. she uh, survived a um, mock execution on a military base in Hankala. Exactly. I mean, all of this, mm -hmm. and it didn't stop her. I mean, n a any norm normal human being would just stop doing what she was doing. What do you think? Why did she continue? I think uh, it's she just had an enormous uh, sense of responsibility not uh, just responsibility for her family, but responsibility for the, all the people. She wanted people to know what's going on there uh, because uh, actually people didn't want to know. And that was her problem because uh, usually people prefer to, to watch, uh, I don't know, football match or see comedy than just to think about terrible th uh, things happening in some part of your country. And uh, she wanted just to, uh, people to wake up from this uh, state of their mind. Do you think she achieved something with what she was doing? Do you think she influenced people? Some people, yes, but I it's not possible to influence everybody. You know, some people just don't want to be influenced and they uh, have like a, a shield in front of them. They are quite happy where they are, and that's it. Um, yes, I would love actually to move from Anna and talk about Masih and Iran, because I have the same questions, in fact. Masih, you were a parliamentary correspondent in, um, in parliament in Iran in 2005, was it? 2005, I got expelled from. Right, because you uncovered this corruption of the parliamentarians. So what happened? I mean, how, how did you become this exiled journalist and now 
somebody who has quarter of a million people on her Facebook uh, following Masih all the time um, and what she writes. I used to, I mean, write about, I mean, I get used to write about people, not myself, uh, so it's quite difficult to tell about, I mean, say you about my story. But how I decided to become a journalist, it has got a story, because I was born in a small village in Iran, close to Caspian Sea, north of Iran, and I grew up in a family, in a traditional family, which I, uh, I used to see my brothers um, having their basic rights, which I did not have. And I used to see um, you know, um, TV and seeing people from big city or um, capital of Iran, they are having some basic um, right on their life which we do not have it and we were we used to facing um, you know difficult um, a lot of problem in a small village without being heard in media and I was only 19 I was a student and I I, um, I got married in that age to became a bit you know more free and having more freedom getting out from my village then um, I became uh, involved in, in uh, student activities and kind of um, political activities in a, in a young, early age. But we got arrested by the government in our small town. And I was pregnant in that time. Um, I was in prison with my ex-husband, my brother, my sister-in-law, and with my baby. And um, then one of my friends got executed just because of doing some political activities in a small town. But the story was just heard by my family and my people in my small village and my small town, not the rest of the world, not even Tehran, the capital of Iran. That was really difficult because we have to just suffer this story just our own, our own you know, just my, my family and people who, who know us. How and long, I decided... How it, long did you spend in prison? Because I was pregnant, because of my baby, I got released after one year, but I was banned from studying there. Only one year. <laughs> no, sorry, I, me no, I made a mistake. My brother was two years and a half, my ex-husband was one year, and I was one month because of baby. So being mother sometimes, it's good and helpful. <laughs> but I was banned uh, from studying, and um, I was banned you know, from working for the, any, any institution, for a governmental institution. So I was not allowed to go to study. In that time, I decided to become a journalist and tell about my story and uh, my people's story in our small village and um, let the rest of people hear about, what going, hear about what's going on in a small village. That's why I decided to become a journalist, but it was really difficult for me because of the, you know, thing, when they get your fingerprints and they are not allowed you to study, then you're not allowed to go to, uh, you know, work or become a journalist. But during the reformist group, I found the chance to become a journalist and um, tell about a lot of untold story. Right. So that's but why I became, um, you know, I was forced to leave Iran in 2009 after the stolen election. Weren't you afraid? I mean, you, you then became a journalist and then you, you immediately uncovered corruption of the parliamentarians. I mean, there are no women parliamentarians, right, at that time in Iran? There was, was there any? There are, there are only um, like um, six, eight, and ten in several um, majlis or parliaments in Iran uh, among uh, 290 uh, MPs. Um, so there are only ten or sometimes eight or nine women. In that time, actually, I am, I mean, I was scared. I'm just a you know, normal person like, like, like everybody. I was really scared to, um, to, to write about the corruption. And I'm, I'm, I have to tell you that um, when they want to criticize you because they know that um, you speak out, you stand up and talk about your rights, and they are not going to criticize your job. They're going to criticize your, um, uh, you know, your, um, because you're a woman because you, 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 you got divorced and you're not in the same level of the other women. So I have to keep my life uh, as a secret for five years and show that I am just a you know, young girl, I'm not a mom, I am just, you know. Um, in that time, when I was writing about the corruption and I asking them about that how many you know, salary you achieve, um, one of the 
uh, MPs who was Mullah in Iran. He started to challenge, not about my question, not about my job, saying that, why are you not covering your hair? Why you don't put your hair fully under your scar? If you don't do that, I'm going to just, you know, punch on your face and kick you out. And he really took his um, clothes and he ran after me. And then I was, you know, just running um, away from parliament. So I'm telling this story to say to you that it's not, you know, easy to be a woman and a journalist in Iran. But we do have a lot of strong women inside Iran now. They're doing the same job as me. That's why I cannot really call or, you know, uh, say that I am brave. Now, this time, because there are a lot of people in Iran who got their children, who, who lost their children, and um, their children and their family got shot and killed in prison, and my colleagues inside Iran, they are not allowed to write about them, I just became a, mo a microphone. I just became a you know, mouthpiece. I became just a voice. Otherwise, I can say that the brave woman, women are them, those mothers who I have interviewed the family of uh, more than 56 people who got shot and killed. I broke the news of those people who got tortured and beaten to death in prison. That's why I really wish today, instead of me, those mothers were here um, addressing you. I have to ask this question, but who's threatening you at the moment? I mean, really, here in, in, in the UK, you're in exile and you're still under death threats? I have to be honest with you. For Iranian journalists and Iranian um, you know, activists, it's really normal to get death threat. If you don't get this kind of things, you get surprised and you think, <laughs> what I'm doing wrong? We don't get any, you know, we don't take it serious. Why? Because we see a lot of people, how, how they are suffering inside Iran. Because I, I was um, actually, before coming to this panel, I wrote something to read for you. But um, um, they stopped me to read from my laptop. They said that just come here and speak and talk and be yourself, which I did. And I was going to say that in my laptop, sometimes I really carry my people on my shoulder. Because in Iran, when they force you as a journalist to leave Iran because they want you to stay away from these kind of news, they want to bury them. They want to bury the news like the people, like the protesters, like, like those students who got shot in the street. Then when you are here and when you became a microphone, by, by microphone I say, I mean indeed with heart as well, when you became a microphone and voice of them, so they, tra they threaten you because they want you to keep silent. So in my laptop, there are the, vo I mean, there are the voice of, um, as I told you before, the family of 56. This is not just a statistic. This is just not a number. The, I mean, individual person has got their own story. And when I hear their voice and they ask me not to be silent, they ask me to speak out, they ask me about, you know, tell the, 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 their story to the rest of the world, I cannot keep silent and I cannot take those you know, emails really serious because I am now this time I am hearing every day uh, to do, uh, I mean the story of these mothers and political prisoners. I've interviewed the family of those people who got executed, who, who is still in prison. Just and the crime is just be uh, be a journalist, just be a community organizer. Uh, organizer in America or in the UK or some country being a um, community organizer ends up being a president, but in my country ends up being in jail. I, I must say that uh, Masih became also uh, very well known uh, when she, apart from enraging the Iranian um, officials, she actually wrote a letter to Obama because she wanted to interview her, him. She got a visa, went to America as Iranian journalist, and Obama did not give her interview, although her visa was connected to actually interviewing Obama. So it was quite bizarre. So I can in the tell end, you why. right? And then you uh, wrote an open letter to Obama, yeah, yeah. The, the, very the, quickly because yeah, yeah, yeah. because that, that time I was working for a newspaper, belonged to one of the presidential challenger. Then I asked for interview, so we did, I didn't expect that. 
in Iran after the stolen election, our people came out and speak out, and I didn't even expect that much brutality. brutality. So the, a lot of people got shot in the street, and my newspaper was closed down. At the same time when I was in the state, and um, I was accepted by the State Department, but my newspaper was shut down, was closed down. When I asked the State Department to give me the interview, interview because I just passed all the way, and they said, if we give you the interview, then we are going to be blamed by the Iranian government. Why? Because they might say that we are supporting the Green Movement, which was not true. So we are stopped by our government, and the door was closed by, you know, by the Western government as well. So we have got a, you know, we've got a lot of difficulties inside Iran, outside Iran. Thank you, and we will go back to asking questions from you to Masih and to Elena and to Mariam. But we have two more speakers too, because we have one on Skype. Mariam, Mariam, you come from Darfur, and you're the chair and the founder of the Voice of Darfur Women. Um, you, you started your organization in 2010 in order to help those women refugees from internally displaced as well from uh, the conflict, the genocidal actually cleansing, I would say, of Darfur. And by the way, you also come from a small village, don't you, like Masih in Darfur. So what made you do all this work with the Voice of Darfur Women? Um, the Voice of Darfur Women is an organization um, formed with a group of um, those who are surviving, most of them surviving the war um, in Darfur, um, which is, if we can describe it, um, Darfur genocide, it's um, one of the shameful um, crises that happens in the 21st century. And um, the problem is it's, it's still ongoing. Um, after um, Rwanda genocide, the world has pledged it's never again. But um, unfortunately, it happened um, again in Darfur. And still, it's now 11 years. But there is no solution for that. And um, one of the um, most destructive um, weapons um, has been used in Darfur crisis is um, um, sexual violence against women, where they use rape as a, as a weapon of war. And um, we all know the, uh, the bad consequences of, um, of a woman when, or a girl when it has been raped and, um, um, and what is um, going to be the, um, how the rest of her life is going to be. Um, we formed this group here to, to help um, our survivors and to help those um, who um, or to campaign for peace and justice to become again to Darfur. The activists, yeah. Kalima Bashir, who received our award, was a doctor who one day in treating victims, she started treating girls coming to the hospital, flooding the hospital in Darfur, as young as six years old, being ganged raped by the Janjavid militia, men on horses, attacking their girls' school and raping equally the girls and the teachers. And then she spoke to the United Nations and Halima was threatened, then taken herself, raped by the army and by the militia to silence her. So, um, the story of Halima inspired you to start your organization, but there are many other activists and also survivors of violence in Darfur. Do you think you're, you're successful in influencing uh, the life of the survivors? Um, yes, um, when you, you be in a position where you, um, you experience similar painful um, harms to you, um, and then you find yourself have the, um, the capacity or have the chance or being in a safe place um, talking. So um, you find yourself uh, automatically being like voice for the voiceless. Um, as Halima and other um, Darfurian activists, women activists who um, refuse to be silent and um, they want uh, you know, to expose what is happening exactly um, in Darfur and uh, trying to um, to save the lives of um, members of their community. 
We'll come back to asking you more questions. I'm conscious that we are calling Rim Rashad on Skype, and I hope it works out, who is a Syrian activist and the sister of Razan Zaytunek, our 2011 Anna Politkovska Award winner. Razan, who was kidnapped two months ago in Syria. So we're talking to her sister, who also, for her own protection, security, uh, is going to talk just as a voice to us and not on video. Um, I'm going to try to call her, so. Can you hear Hello. us? Hi. Hi. Uh, everybody, all our guests today can hear you. You're on a speakerphone. So, Reem. Yes. Can you, yes. Can you please um, tell us, you, we already heard from the other activists about their work from Iran, Darfur, and we heard about Anna from her sister. Can you please tell us about you, your work, and also about Razan? What motivated Razan? What is motivating you? I mean, you're also under threat. I know that you have prepared something. Maybe you, you can just read or you can just answer as you wish. We're listening. Oh. OK, first, uh, warm greetings to all. Uh, my name is Reem. Uh, I am a human rights activist and a member of the team of the Violation Discrimination Center in Syria. Uh, I am uh, the sister of Razan Zaytouni, who received the Anna Portukovskaya Award uh, in 2011. Uh, Razan was kidnapped in December last year together with her husband and two of her colleagues uh, in order uh, to silence her and to stop her doing her human rights work, uh, we have not heard any news of uh, Razan or uh, of uh, the other uh, activists. Um, for me, I work in the center documenting human rights violations uh, against civilians in Syria, an organization which my sister Razan started. We try to document all violations that happen on all sides of the conflict, from extrajudicial execution and uh, forced uh, disappearances uh, to unlawful and arbitrary detention, torture and ill treatment by state against of the regime, as well as abused, abuses by non-state actors. We try to collect statistics, uh, medical certificates, and eyewitness uh, testimonies uh, in order to establish the truth of uh, what really happened in cases of killings, uh, torture, and uh, persecution by officers of the regime or members of the opposition. I uh, founded the Medical Room uh, VDC Medical Aid Project, which consists of two virtual rooms on the internet, uh, one room for activists, uh, civilians, and groups on the ground, and another room comprising of uh, doctors from all around the world. The aim of uh, this room is uh, to connect the sick and injured people inside Syria and the Syrian refugees who need medical attention with the, Syria, uh, with the Syrian and other doctors from around. The war... Can you hear us? Can you hear well, Rim? Hello, Rim. Can you hear us? Yeah, yes, yes, I can. Please hear. continue. Yes. 
We're listening. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so the other doctors from around the world who could provide assistance and medical advice and treatment via the internet. Sometimes doctors from abroad are also providing help, uh, help and advice to doctors inside some of the besieged sites inside Syria and how best to treat some complicated cases that need uh, medical attention. We also provide uh, psychological and trauma, uh, trauma uh, therapy, therapy to Syrian women refugee and women survivor of uh, violence inside Syria through the virtual medical room. Uh, this is uh, this is about me. Now, my sister Razan Zaytouni has been called the Jasmine of Damascus and the icon of the Syrian revolution by the people of Syria with her human rights work. She planted hope in the hearts of everyone even before the revelation and later since the revelation began. What's During the time... During the time of the revelation, Razan has been involved in so many activists, uh, to, uh, activities to help the civilian under attack, such as helping with the humanitarian relief and documenting the daily abuses against the Syrian people. Razan founded the Violation Documentation Center in Syria and uh, the coordinate the coordination uh, committees in Syria, both of which are among the most in, uh, the most important sources of information and facts about each human rights uh, violation and the abuses against civilians committed both by the army and the armed opposition group. Razan has worked for years hiding in Syria. Uh, persecuted by the regime that wanted to silence her, but she refused to be silent and uh, work in secret, having, having to move often from house to house because the army was looking to arrest her, or had to stay inside the house for long periods of the time without going outside. She never complained and continued uh, tirelessly to do her work. Daily supporting people who suffered unbelievable cruelty to feel their pain and to um, and to write about their cases, trying to give voice to the victims of violence and to let the world know and make people care about the Syrians. Razan wrote many articles as a journalist, deceiving uh, the describing the injustice, uh, the, the life under siege, the oppression and the death and destruction which the Syrian people suffered daily at the hands of the Syrian regime and the army. Razan also wrote about liberated areas and did not spare criticism towards the armed opposition group and abuses of civilians by them. It touched our feeling deeply to read Razan stories about the life under siege and the stories about the suffering uh, of uh, common people with no hope to escape and no doubt Razan herself did this work. Razan herself did this work while living under siege and under bombardment. Uh, bombardments and under fire, accompanied with the feeling of hunger and the intense pain of diseases and infections which she gets from. Uh, drinking polluted water, uh, no access to food or vitamins for months, and no available medicines. Razan's life became even worse in the last months, especially after moving to East Ghouta in the liberated areas of the country, while the Razan has supported the establishment of women's center in East Ghouta and Duma. 
supporting projects uh, for women to help them survive under siege by learning new skills and uh, generate, um, generating some income to support their families. Razan was kidnapped on 9 on December uh, 2013. Two months had passed since Razan and her colleagues were kidnapped. But the kidnappers have not disclosed uh, the reason or um, re they released her. Sorry. The reason of uh, the kidnap. Rim, I know that you haven't heard from Razan ever since um, 9th of December, but you do know that probably members of the ar armed opposition uh, groups in the liberated areas, the Army of Islam members, is behind this kidnapping. Yeah, we, um, we demand uh we demand them uh, for the kidnap, but we don't uh, accuse that for them. No, but uh, basically nobody has asked for any money or anything. So it's just they want Razan and her colleagues to be silenced and not to do the human rights work, yes. it seems. Y yes. We continue to demand Rahan and her colleagues uh, release as quickly as possible. But uh, so far, we have not heard anything about their whereabouts or state of health, and none of the opposition commanders have made any effort to help us find Razan. I appeal to you and the good people in the world who care about what is happening to us in Syria, please keep the pressure on your government and support our efforts to find Razan and bring her back to us. Thank you. Rim, can you hear us? London is clapping, and London is with you, and the WOW Festival women here. So we will all tweet and write on Facebook and do noise and make noise in order to get um, Razan's case not to be forgotten and hopefully to see Razan back to us, to all of us. Thank you so much. Now. Thank, thank you very much.